morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and very welcome to um, our live debate this morning. Uh, um, as Ricardo said, there are some novelty, uh, more visible uh, novelties that you will to see is that this is um, an all-female event. Uh, I am chairing, as uh, Ricardo uh, just mentioned, and we have two uh, renowned experts. Um, in the electricity sector, who will be joining me uh, this morning to debate the subject of when will grids, be, when will European grids be smart? So I would like to introduce uh, both of uh, the participants in today's live debate. Uh, first of all, I'm um, turn to Astrid Brandt up in uh, Oslo today, and uh, he is probably well known to many people who attend Florence School of regulation events. Uh, she is from the TSO up there at uh, Spotnet and she will just give us a couple of minutes introduction to herself and her perspective on the topic. Astrid. Good morning everyone. Well, I'm Astrid. Um, I worked in um, the electricity industry uh, since the late 80s uh, and I've been with Spotnet since the liberalization of the Norwegian um, electricity industry in uh, 92 and uh, I've been the general counsel of Stotland since year 2000. Um, why is this interesting? Um, the smart grid I think is important to combat the most important challenge we have um, in the electricity industry and that is the uh, climate uh, challenge. Um, and as a TSO, we have to combat the climate challenge and at the same time deliver uh, security of supply, affordable security of supply. Um, so what is that for the question for or today's question? Um, I'm thinking about the uh, shift. Uh, we have the new German term, the uh, vendor. Uh, to me, that means that we have less flexible production, um, namely more production at the distribution level, more hydro, more sun, and less of the traditional um, production. Um, so that means we have less um, to balance with for, on the production side. At the same time, if we are thinking smart, we have um, customers that are uh, more flexible. Um, we can um, have more predictability on when they use electricity and with the uh, new um, two-way communication with the customer we can also turn automatically on and off their devices. So here I think it's uh, very important to take the smartness the possibilities that the technology will give us and maybe we will need uh, less production which is the most environmentally friendly move we can take. Um, another issue, why is Norway important here? I think uh, from Norway uh, we have had traditionally 99% hydro production which is very weather dependent and all the renewables seem to have namely that characteristic that it is weather dependent and um, maybe some of the smartness and some of the thinking uh, a combination with the history and the plans we have up north here um, can facilitate uh, the work and we are in the lead of of one of the interesting R&D projects namely the GARPA where we're looking into the smartness and it's uh, rather fascinating. I think I'll leave it there, Lee, for now. Thank you very much, Astrid, for that uh, short and very informative introduction. Now, I'd like to now turn to our second participant. Anna, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, good morning. So, Anna Aguado will shortly uh, introduce herself and her new function. Thank you, Lee. Uh, so, um, like uh, Astrid, I have been also working in the electricity sector for uh, quite some time, 23 years exactly. And I started in the European Commission when the first directive was uh, going to be adopted. 
And uh, right after, when it was adopted, then I left for the industry. So I have also seen the industry moving from um, uh, completely bundled um, utilities to the started of unbundling with the transmission system operators, with whom I worked also for some years. And, uh, and now recently, only uh, not even two months, I have moved to the DSLs business. So I have seen now the whole spectrum from generation, transmission to distribution in this uh, electricity sector. Uh, why, of course, the issue of smart grids is important. Well, now I work for the DSLs for ETSO for smart grids and is one of our major uh, um, objectives in the association to make those smart grids really a reality in the, in the future and the more near future, the better. I, I agree with what um, Astrid has said, of course, the smart grids are important for um, reaching the 2030 objectives. So you Barbara, have mentioned- can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I have a warning saying I have a- So I hope uh, everybody else could hear you. <laughs> Can you hear okay, me? I don't know where, I, where I, I left, but I was explaining that I agree with Astrid that um, the smart grids are important for reaching the 2030 objectives. And uh, you have mentioned especially two of them, climate change, of course, security of supply. There is also the objective of the internal market. It was supposed to be done in 2014, and we all know that that is not going to be possible from now to the end of the year, and especially in the retail part of the internal market. Um, so, this smart grid should be capable of helping consumers to become prosumers and therefore the retail market become really a part of the internal market. Um, but I think it's also very important because of growth and jobs. We are listening this last uh, weeks very much to the proposal of Mr. Juncker, which will be um, uh, published on Wednesday in two days, how uh, Europe can invest in the next three years in order to create the maximum jobs and growth. And we have some figures already in ETSO from studies like Evolve DSO, financed by the by FP7, by the European Union, in which we have already amazing figures only for Spain, which are the figures that I, I got uh, recently. Uh, the GDP growth from now to 2030 could be from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 per year. There could be 200,000 um, uh, jobs created from now to 2020 because of the investments in the smart grids and from all the investments that are necessary in the next 10 years, which is estimated to more than 10,000 million euro, you will get two to three point times the benefit of those investments. So also from the economical point of view and not only environmental or security of supply, it really makes sense to make the shift. I will leave it there also, Lee. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, maybe the first question that we could uh, deal with is um, how will TSOs and DSOs interact in the new business model that we will need to roll out these smart European grids? I think this is a very interesting issue and one which you are both very qualified to talk about given that you have uh, different sectors uh, in which you have worked in which you both have uh, incredible experience so maybe we'll first start with the with the TSO and ask Astrid how she sees uh, the model the business model perhaps changing in Norway and elsewhere in Europe if she can offer some insights into that um, so that how will DSOs and TSOs interact in the future to deliver these smart grids uh, I think the prerequisite and, and where we have to start, that is with the collection of data. And um, I think all over Europe, they are now working with the uh, AMS or the uh, um, collecting of data and the smart meter in every household. Um, I know that there are different ways of dealing with this question um, in Europe. Uh, in Norway, and I believe also in Denmark, there is a national um, scheme, um, we call it the data hub, where we are going to collect all the data national-wide um, to 
in order to um, have a central information platform uh, where um, we have a background for the balancing and where then the, the consumers uh, or the prosumer uh, can be part of, of the balancing. And I think that is, um, that's the, the background uh, and how it, how it has to, to work. Um, the magnitude, the flexibility, how the consumers will organize themselves. I mean, we may only have visions of that yet, at least in our part of the world. So we don't know how it, how it will raise. Um, one scenario, um, is that uh, consumption will decrease and that maybe the consumers will be less energy dependent. At the same time, um, we see now, at least today, with the IT technology, that we are more dependent on security of supply than ever. Um, therefore, um, even if the consumer doesn't need much electricity, he would like to have um, the security that backup production and the grid will give him. It is difficult to have the willingness to pay for small consumption used in a very short time span. Um, so if it will develop this way, um, I think the pricing mechanism will have to be amended and we will really have to work with the business model to find out how uh, we can not just be more efficient, which we will have to, to be, but also how we can have acceptance for the reliability in the system. Thank you very much, Astrid. I think this raises some interesting questions about um, who will benefit uh, from the business model and how savings uh, in energy use will be shared between DSOs and TSOs. Uh, and how perhaps extra costs will have to be placed uh, up the supply chain or up the network chain as well. Maybe Anna would like to comment on that too. Well, yes, certainly the cost, of course, for, for the network are going to increase. That is not uh, a secret. But you have to take into account that in, in the last uh, 20 years, the cost of the network have always decreased. One of the objectives of uh, in the regulatory frameworks in all the member states was to reduce the tariffs and um, the regulated part of the business is the network. So electricity prices might have uh, gone up, but normally the costs or the, the, the part in the tariffs dedicated to networks has been reduced. In the last few years, it's true that it's starting to increase because new investments have to be made, especially on the smart part of it, but also because you have to review the, the, the existing grid. What the figures are very clear from many studies already financed uh, at European Union level is that the investments in the smart devices are going to be less expensive than investing just in uh, increasing the capacity of the networks, uh, certainly at distribution level. So although they will have to now go up, it will be less expensive to invest in the smartness. But there is something very important, of course, which is to inform the consumers, uh, create awareness what is going to happen in the future, why they will have to pay more for these uh, network investments, but at the same time, they are paying less than if it was business as usual. And for us, I think this awareness is really crucial. And that has to come certainly from the industry side, but also at regulator side, at political level, at local, national and European level, there has to be some kind of campaign to create this awareness. And uh, we are going to launch in January, hopefully, if it is ready, a new website that uh, ETSO has uh, developed with ESMIC, which is the Association of Smart Meters, in order to explain in very easy terms to consumers, to cities, to municipalities, uh, what is a smart meter, what is a smart grid, why they are necessary, what are the, some of the problems that people could see, why they don't exist in reality. So, you know, a step in, in, in the direction of this awareness. And um, I wanted to say for, from the question before that uh, Astrid was uh, answering, um, of course, the data exchange is one of the major issues between TSOs and DSOs, I fully agree, but also flexibility. 
take into account that DSOs are not allowed to implement flexibility with its own users of the network, and that in the majority of the member states. So there is a need for regulatory change um, because the network, of course, is going to be used, is going to be operated in a different manner, much closer to what the TSOs do today in their own networks. Can you maybe explain a little bit more what that means then, that DSOs are not allowed uh, to market flexibility? No, the, the, the DSOs are allowed, exactly, so uh, they don't have the means to invest in, in, uh, in offering this kind of flexibility, at least for congestions, they should be able to do that. Sometimes the TSOs get the information directly from uh, producers that are connected to the DSO network uh, for ancillary services, but the DSO doesn't get that information. So sometimes, of course, the network is put or could be put in the future, not until now, at, um, at risk if the DSO doesn't have this kind of information. That's one thing. And then the other thing is offering this kind of services. It doesn't exist in the legislation, in the regulations, the possibility for the DSOs, instead of doing certain investments on the network, just to offer this flexibility. Of course, we are not actors in the market. We are market facilitators. So some of those services, we don't have to give them. We will never give them. But some of them for operating the network, those will be necessary. And it's not, uh, it's not in the regulations. Until now, the DSOs didn't have to do that. So asking so one of the kind of a balancing service. Sorry, it's a kind of a balancing service. Yes, it's a, it's a type of balancing. Service. Yes. Okay, let's turn back to Astrid and see how she would look at that as a TSO, as indeed, as you said, this is what the TSOs do now. Do you see? Um, perhaps a difficult question for lawyers to answer. That's a kind of technical question too, or it raises technical I issues, but. Uh, but I think, uh, as most things in the industry, it's both technical and regulatory or, or legal. Uh, and I think uh, complexity um, always increases risk. Uh, why do I say that? I think it's very important for the TSO to have direct contact with those who can or have the regulatory abilities. If the DSO uh, becomes the middleman, um, so that the TSO doesn't have direct access to uh, those who can be regulated. I think that could put system operation at risk. Um, I think it needs to be flexibility. If the question from Anna, on the other hand, was whether we should have more transparency um, so that the DSOs uh, should have information about producers and uh, provided the DSO was a neutral market facilitator, um, I can't see any problems with that. And also that the DSOs could, could uh, play a role in the overall system operation. But I think um, from a TSO perspective, it's very important that there isn't any risk with information flow, the correctness of information and the efficient system operation. And I think that's also what the customer need very safe um, security of supply and safe operations. I'm sure those points um, are shared by, by many listeners. And yet, if we, if we look at the future market, as more and more renewable energy comes onto the network, um, I think many might argue, well, that type of energy is actually coming into DSO networks, into, into local networks. So maybe uh, uh, to respond to that technical development, DSOs should not just have this neutral position. Is that something that one could accept? Anna, what do you think? Well, that's the thing. 90% already of uh, renewables are connected to the distribution network. In fact, the big part of the networks are the distribution networks compared to transmission. So. This is why it's important for the DSO that all this generation that is coming more and more and at different levels of generators, it's not going to be anymore only the medium voltage, but really the low, low voltage level. So any household will be able to become a producer, will have a storage one day. You will need to give them the possibility to manage their consumption, their production in a very efficient way. And at the same time, without putting at risk the, the network, 
but also the distribution network. This is why the information that is important for the TSO becomes more and more important also for the DSOs because they will have to operate their network in the same way as today TSOs operate their own network. And uh, this is just going to increase. I mean, the electric cars will be plugged in. Um, today, you have the consumers that are those that have, uh, you know, uh, PV in the roofs or have a small uh, um, wind uh, windmill, they get some money from putting the electricity into the network in some member states, not even in all of them, uh, so that they can reduce their, their, their tariff and they can reduce the, the final price. But this is only the very beginning. There will be more and more kind of services that uh, providers will be able to give to these uh, consumers. We have to use the data from the consumers because we will have it in any case but we are not the owners of it we will have to provide it to other users for that part of the market which is really not related of course to monopolies as we are but then there is another part which is for operating the network and it's this kind of information that we will need to have in any case even if the tso also will need it but there will be always a difference between data that we will be able, with the agreement of the consumers, to give to third parties so that they can provide market services from the data that is necessary to operate the network. Thank you. I think that that's clear. I think, obviously, the, the TSO will have to assume an incredibly complex coordinating function um, in order to make this whole system work, because I presume the scope for DSOs to coordinate outside their area is, is always going to be rather restricted. So the TSO will continue to play a very important role in that respect. Yeah. Can Would I add a comment, please? Uh, yes. I was thinking, we are thinking large and small at the same time here. On one hand, we are thinking about the DSO that will have an important role with, uh, with the rise of the prosumer that's developed from being a consumer. At the same time, we're now uh, building the trans-European electricity market, the integrated market. And, and I think the idea about that is to have the most efficient use of the different characteristics of, of the different regions in Europe. Uh, and it's important uh, that we use the big things and the small things at the same time, so that we have now uh, the integrated market where we, use, we produce electricity where it's cheapest and most environmentally friendly at all times and, and that we coordinate then at the local level and that we don't switch from the integrated uh, regional corporation into the micromanagement. I think it's quite important to uphold the process we're in and at the same time including this new idea of the DSO and the prosumer role. That was my comment. You think both are necessary? Right. So your comment really is, we need both. Yes. You don't have to have one at the expense of the other. Would you agree with that, Anne? I fully agree. But, you know, I have been uh, <laughs> working for many years about this trans-European and unique market and uh, and so far, so bad. So, you know, you have to do something in any case at national level because for the time being, unless this European Union that uh, now we are apparently taking it seriously from uh, the institution's point of view at European level, comes with something else, so far the energy policies continue to be very national. And, uh, you know, having some interconnectors especially, especially. will not take it. Yeah, an internal market, not really. We need much more, but I fully agree. Especially the uh, the retail level, where there the internal market perhaps has had the least effect. And one of the um, big challenges that many see to the rollout of smart grids and, and, and demand response is that as long as we have price regulation, retail price regulation, consumers really won't be sensitized or have any incentive to become the prosumers that they have to be uh, in order to react to the messages that they're getting from all this smart technology. I mean, we can have everything as smart as we can, 
Uh, but if the consumers don't see a financial benefit, which they're not going to perhaps see with retail price control, then surely that's one of the biggest obstacles to, to, to this great future. I fully agree with that. Yeah, and uh, and one of the first things, of course, is transparency in the bill, and that the mm -hmm. consumers understand exactly what is put in the bill, what is what, and when you have this transparency, then you can add the 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 incentive, and the incentive will be prices, of course, as it is the same in the wholesale uh, parts of the market. The incentive is the final price. If you don't if you're not able to explain that and you're not able to see that in the bill and uh, you will not be able to flexibilize, you know, the, the, the consumption pattern, the, the efficiency pattern, nothing. So we have examples um, from, uh, from existing uh, FP7 projects in which there have been rollouts of uh, demonstration projects of a smart, uh, smart grids with the smart meters. And for example, you have 10,000 uh, consumers in a certain uh, small city that have been provided with all or some of these smart devices, both the grid and the, um, and the consumers. And then you see even with all of them being provided with the same uh, smart devices, the differences in the efficiency that they have managed to get at the end of each month. Some of them even 20%, others only 3 or 4%. Of course, the ones that have reached the 20% because they manage really to consume less have seen uh, probably um, and hopefully a difference in the in the final price from those that only got three to four percent. But even if the, in the worst case of these 10,000, three or four percent efficiency was uh, was reached with the investment in the in these smart devices. So the results the are exactly the cost of it yeah. was already paid for. Yeah. Astrid, do you see this sort of uh, development changing the business model too of the TSOs as, as you have to become more transparent? Um, it, from my part of the world, up in the north, um, we have transparency as part of the sort of fundamental legislation with the um, at least the um, public disclosure law and the um, tradition that we have up here. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, I see from the parts of the market where you have price regulation is that you do have a market, but you don't really trust it. So I think if, if you want a market, then you need to trust the mechanisms in the market and not uh, repair it with market regulation, um, but let the prices go when they should go. And I think when we see the imperfections and we see the reforms and, and what you're describing, that's because we don't have the courage to believe in the market, even if it's a market-based reform we are in the middle of. Thank you. Maybe to turn to um, a related subject, we talked about smart grids, smart meters, uh, how consumers have to become more efficient in using these new technologies to uh, realize all the benefits. But maybe a last topic to touch upon is uh, getting to smarter regulation. Um, I think uh, Anna began uh, in her introduction mentioning there are many gaps in the regulations, the current European regulatory framework that doesn't uh, really recognize um, this revolution or allow it to perhaps uh, blossom as quickly as it might. So perhaps you might need a fourth um, energy package coming through uh, that will allow a greater stimulus of smart um, grids. A couple of wishes for the coming season um, when Father Christmas might come down the chimney. What would you what would you like him to bring on the regulatory front? Anna, have you a wish list? Well we we are um, we are not yet uh, talking about the need for a fourth package, but uh, certainly something will be needed in the future. And uh, so far we're waiting for this retail communication that should be published in the first quarter of next year. 
and in the retail communication, we expect to see some of those elements that might become then part of a regulatory framework or will have to be um, set up in some kind of regulatory framework at European level. And then, because we're talking especially about distribution, then uh, you always have to adapt to the national needs because so far there are still many differences between member states. But um, yes, certainly for what we were saying before about flexibility and the possibility to offer this kind of flexibility for operating the network and for allowing the consumers to become prosumers, all that will have to be regulated somehow, even if afterwards there are differences at member state level. At European level, you can give some guidelines because in the end, consumers are consumers everywhere. And there is always some you know, basics that uh, could apply in other member states. So in my opinion, there will be need for something, whether it is a fourth package or we want to call it in another way because it will be more specific. Um, the data issue, maybe will need to be uh, regulated somehow, especially on the privacy part uh, for consumers. Um, so I see some kind of regulatory proposals coming up in the next years. Thank you. Astrid, any thoughts on that subject? You don't yet have the third pack. It's not um, the part so of, many of the question that I'm uh, most connected to. You are mostly uh, involved in. you further ahead a number of other Sorry? Uh. I, I fear that Lee's connection is a bit slow. So uh, before replying to her comments, just wait some seconds. Uh, maybe Lee, can you repeat I, what I you think just said? Lost. I was asking after it, uh, to reflect on the introduction of more smart regulation. Um, <laughs> coming from Norway, of course, they haven't implemented yet the third package, but as Astrid herself explained, uh, they have the Norwegian system, or the whole of the Nordic system, has always been very innovative. And she mentioned herself that uh, they have made already a lot of progress on the transparency front, on uh, data protection. So maybe um, she might like to recommend to the rest of Europe what was you uh, to learn the Nordic system so far in this area. Hmm. I think the, the Norwegian electricity reform, uh, which was one of the first in 1992, um, I think what we've learned is that less is more and learn to trust the market if you have a market reform. Um, and I think transparency is imperative and that you should allow for efficient cooperation at all levels between the industry. Um, and I think uh, when we look at the regulation, second package, third package, um, both in the directives and um, in the secondary legislation, you will see that there are some terms that are not very precise. I think that might be intentionally uh, because the electricity structure, the structure of the uh, consumers, the um, like Norway, it's a very big country with few inhabitants. Other countries like the Netherlands is uh, very um, highly populated with a smaller area. We have different production structure, uh, different industries. Um, we can't have one size fit all. We can only have one size fits nobody. Um, so I think if we should have reg like regulation at the European level, it's important only to have those frameworks that set the direction and then leave it to the industry, the good intentions um, and the, at national level to make something that will work and also locally. Because I think if you put the industry in a straitjacket, you won't get the most efficient out of them. I think that would be my reflection on this. But leave leave the direction and make sure uh, that you get the environmental friendly, the efficient use, 
um, get as much capacity as you can to the market, continue with the R&D like we do with the GARPA project. I really believe in these incentives and um, all the, the good work that's been done now at all levels in the industry, um, from Anna to the producers. I think we all see the challenge and that we all like to go in the right direction to make it. And I think maybe the politicians need to to facilitate it, but also trust it. Thank you. And um, we have a lot of questions coming in the audience. Um, and so maybe uh, in the last part of this debate, I could put some of those questions to you. Um, so I think perhaps a question we briefly touched on, uh, an issue we briefly touched on, but this is uh, a rather more specific um, formulation of that question. Um, so if, consume, if consumption does decrease as a result of uh, smarter consumer action, uh, how will the fixed costs of transmission and distribution uh, these, uh, of the networks be paid for? <laughs> this, exactly. I think this is a big issue, of course. So maybe a short, a short response to that. Are you uh, optimistic that this uh, will continue? That, uh, well, in, in, my facing a meltdown? in my opinion, in the future, if we go really for more renewable energy sources, in the end, it will be the network part that will be more expensive than the electricity you know, consumption part. So we are advocating to have uh, tariffs that reflect the capacity. And of course, you, know, you always have to have one part that reflects the consumption. That will be the other part of the final bill. But as far as the transmission or distribution, in our case, the distribution is concerned, mm -hmm. We think that we will have more incentives to make these investments and we will have the means to make these investments if we have the tariffs based on capacity, which is not the case today. And in the future, future, you know, in I don't know, 15 years time, 20 years time, probably, yes, it will be this fixed cost that will be the most important part of the final bill because production should be, if we really use our energy resources, uh, natural ones, and I do believe we can do that, uh, it will be lower. Today. I think um, if we have the consumers and the consumption uh, from the um, industries and, and the end consumer will be lower, uh, we will need two things for the security of supply. You will have to have backup production. So on the cold day when the wind is not blowing, you also would like your electricity to function. So you need backup uh, production and you need a grid that works. And I, I think the, um, the payment is then need for both. And the question is, what sort of future uh, business model will we have for that? I think the business model will have to be very different from what we have today. Um, I think one um, mechanism that is already in place is the um, um, mechanism uh, in the UK um, where they have uh, introduced a capacity mechanism to make sure that they have um, uh, sufficient production capacity. Maybe you can think of a mechanism or a totally different business model where you have to pay for uh, available capacity and available grid. But I think the payment structure would have to be hard, uh, different than what it is today. And I think, as I said in my, my introduction, um, that I think the acceptance for payment um, for um, available capacity, like an in insurance, um, we will need to, to sell that and have an acceptance for that. Uh, and I do see that that would be harder to have acceptance to pay for that if the bill is high, which I believe it would be, um, because having capacity that you can only sell very few hours per year or, or maybe not use at all, that's harder to pay for than something that you consume every day. Um, but maybe this will be the future. We don't know, but one scenario is that this can be the future. And um, the business model 
where you will have to pay this, i.e. insurance uh, for sufficient grid at high levels and sufficient production, um, I think that will have to develop, but it's not developed yet. Or, or maybe you can also replace one day at least part of these capacity mechanisms or capacity payments with demand side management. It is there for that. I mean, if you have both, then uh, maybe the bill is going to really be high. You will not be able to do much demand side management if you have, in any case, the capacity payments. So it will have to evolve for the time being. Of course, these capacities are necessary, but maybe in the future when demand side is really well established at all levels of consumers, we need less of those capacity mechanisms. Sorry about that, maybe. One final question. I think we still have time for Ricardo, uh, our organizer, um, before we go off the air. Yes, we do. We do. Um, yes, um, is um, a question. Um, should we have regulation, with this indeed be smart regulation, which would oblige electricity consumers um, to um, actually have uh, to use an hourly pricing signal? So I think the question, the question has been slightly mistyped, but I think it's electricity companies should be obliged to offer hourly pricing to households. Um, and so this would actually really speed up the process. Is that something you would be in favor of? seeing this sort of stricter form of regulation? I didn't understand to offer which kind of pricing? Hourly pricing. Hourly pricing, oh, I see, yes, yeah. Well, I think if you if you use smart devices, the thing is that in order to oblige companies to have hourly uh, prices, you also need the smart devices. And if there's no rollout of the smart devices, then you cannot have the hourly uh, pricing. But in my opinion, I don't know, it, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't even need to come as an obligation because if you have the means to do that, it will come automatically. There will be the part where the utilities, where the retailers, where the suppliers will compete to offer these kind of services to the consumers and the ones that will come up before in serving, uh, you know, in serving hourly prices or, or other things will be the leaders in the market. But you need the smart devices in order to be able to offer these kind of services, first of all. Okay. Astrid, do you think that uh, the TSOs the should be is, enrolling yeah. out smart meters more forcefully? I think um, in order to have hourly prices or 15-minute prices or whatever we will have in the future, we need to have the technology in place. Uh, once we have the technology in place, um, the question is uh, whether we should have uh, a whip or a carrot. Um, I think the regulation should definitely not be any hindrance for it. That would be a pity. The regulation should facilitate um, that we do use uh, all the possibilities that, um, regulate, or that the technology gives us. Um, uh, but whether the technology should um, be so detailed as to demand it or whether the industry will not do it themselves, mm, I don't know if that's the most efficient uh, legal methodology. I think the most important is that the regulation does not uh, create any obstacles or any hindrance for the development and if there is a business opportunity for the industry to participants, I believe the industry will run after it. So I'd rather have facilitation and um, benefits for the industry rather than um, requirements and um, yeah, absolutely, absolute regulation. And uh, what I fear in this development we're in, where the technology is, is running so fast and industry is running after it, is that regulation is an hindrance rather than a facilitator. And, and it, it is important that regulation is facilitating the development that we want. Thanks very much. Maybe just one very short final question. Um, uh, we have been asked, when do you think European grids will be smart? Uh, will that happen tomorrow? Well, perhaps that's very unlikely. 
next year or in 20 years? So perhaps you could give a very short answer there. <laughs> For me, by 2020. By 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it. <laughs> our former R&D manager, he laughed about that question and he said, we've been smart for a long time. And he had lots of, <laughs> uh, he had lots of mechanisms in the central grid that are quite smart today and, and where we can deliver a lot more capacity to the market than we can, could some years ago. So I think we are in a very smart development where we've started the use of some smartness already um, and where some uh, of the smart R&D projects are in the pipeline and maybe we can take use of them very soon. But I'm not deeply involved in the project, so I wouldn't give you a fixed date. But with that optimistic note, then perhaps 20, uh, 2020 uh, is, is quite realistic then, which is perhaps view, yes. a, a, good note, yeah, a good note to end on. That's uh, five years away, so hopefully a lot can be achieved. There's a lot at stake, um, a lot of potential to make really important contributions to climate change and uh, to promoting demand response and all the different techniques we can use to make better use of our energy. So let's hope that uh, by 2020 we can have a, a joint a live debate to look back to see what has indeed <laughs> happened to make this a possibility. And I'm sure you'll both all be, both be very active in contributing to that smart transition. So I'd like to thank you very much and turn the floor back over to Ricardo, the organizer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.